All right, let's get started. So we're going to start off uh, with Tina. So we'd love to know, I mean, STEP happens almost every year since 2012, Yeah. right? So we'd love to know this year, what can you bring uh, to the table in terms of information? What has Shuruk been doing in the past year? Great. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today, guys, and uh, just a bit more about Shuruk Partners and who we are. So essentially, we're uh, one of the leading early stage VC funds out of the region. We're a heavily tech-focused fund, so we mainly invest in fintech, software, platform, and other tech-enabled services that are scalable. And we focus on startups in their pre-seed stages until Series A stages, um, essentially in the MENAP region, most specifically GCC, Egypt, Jordan, and of course, uh, Pakistan. Now, we do have, uh, our headquarters are out of uh, Abu Dhabi, but we do have uh, presence in Dubai, Riyadh, Bahrain, Egypt, as well as uh, Pakistan. Over last year, we managed to open an office in Cairo, an office in Pakistan. So we run across partnerships. So we have a partner out of um, Riyadh, we have a partner out of Cairo, we have a partner out of um, uh, Dubai as well, and uh, a principal out of Pakistan. So we want to be all boots on the ground to, in order to be able to help and support and back founders with whatever they might need across the way. Um, in Shuruk in general, we've had more than 40, we've backed more than 45 companies, 100 investments so far. That's not uh, over last year, of course, but we've had a very, very aggressive or essentially active year in 2020 during the pandemic as well as 2021. These were the most active years for us. Um, and we can talk a lot about that uh, as we go. Fantastic. Thank you, Tina. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask Aboudi if you can tell us a little bit more about you. And a big round of applause for Aboudi. He's actually just flown in and temporarily is locating to Dubai because we are the best city in the world, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> big round of applause for that. Can everyone hear me? Yes, right. it's going to get uh, louder. My name is I'm representing Dash Ventures. Uh, we're a VC firm, not a fund based out of Jordan, but with global presence. Uh, founded in 2011 with the idea of finding the next Hikma Pharmaceuticals. And the reason I mention that is because our two LPs were instrumental in Hikma Pharmaceuticals IPO. And the idea was, given what they learned in that IPO, they wanted to find the next Hikma in our region. So it's an evergreen structure, not a typical fund. And what that means is that we're able to invest very flexibly, be very agile, and also move very quickly. We like fintech, we like healthcare, but ultimately we're quite industry agnostic. Um, we move fast, we're also early stage, and we're a lean team. So that's the one difference I say between us and Shuruk is that we're our two partners, our managing director who's based out of Canada, and myself who, as I said, just temporarily moved here, but I tend to bounce around between London, New York, and Amman. Great, welcome. And of course, our surprise guest, uh, Mr. Hamza Khan. Tell us a little bit more about uh, Let's Work, but I think we should get him to pitch Let's Work. What do you guys think? Yeah? Oh boy. All right, let's sure. do it. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Hamza, I'm the co-founder of Let's Work. Uh, Let's Work is a subscription service and marketplace for on-demand workspaces, offices, and meeting rooms. Um, not just across the UAE now, we've recently expanded into Bahrain, Portugal, and Spain, which is super exciting. Uh, so we've joined a, a very, very small club of Emirati-founded UAE startups that are now expanding globally, which we're, which we're delighted about. Um, so, I mean, the story of Let's Work began where um, my co-founder and I were, Omar, we were we're planning on you know building our own co-working spaces and then we quickly realized that you know it's a very capital intensive business there's a lot of risk involved and instead we can we'd rather take a much more asset light approach in the sense that you know there's so much um, underutilized assets around us you have hotels you have co-working spaces you have business centers you have cafes which people love working from so what we've decided to do is basically connect them all with a single membership so with a single let's work membership we can buy a day pass a, a week pass or a month pass you can come and work from our, our, our over 100 spaces with that pass and um, you can you know work individually as a team we have a lot of large uh, startups SMEs who signed up for Let's Work as well uh, as well as large companies so large corporations which are now going either fully remote or, or taking a hybrid approach to remote work um, they're increasingly signing up for Let's Work which we're super excited about and basically having their teams instead of them you know working from a single full-time static office uh, working from this network of, of, of spaces across the country giving them that flexibility giving them that sort of um, ease of access and giving them a great, great, great place to work, really. Fantastic. How did you do? Good? Awesome. Thank you. Who hasn't downloaded the app yet? Put your hands up. 
Oh, come on, you work it. Let's work. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So it's it's honestly it's fantastic. Thank it's you. a great app. I've used it. You get free coffee, guaranteed Wi-Fi in the place that you're going to, and you can work from anywhere across the city. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move to valuations. Um, since this is the hot topic that you're probably all wondering about, who gets to set the valuation for a startup? Is it the VC or is it the startup? Right, and oftentimes, you know, if let's say the valuation is higher because the VC offered that, why wouldn't a startup take it, right? But what if it's in reverse? So this is what I really wanted to pass to the VCs on the board, and then I would love your perspective as well, Hamza. So, you know, how do you at um, Shuruk evaluate your startups? Okay. So that's a tricky question, and there's no right or wrong answer, right? There's um, a lot of science behind them, but a lot of art behind it as well, right? And especially when we're early stage investors, you look at companies who are pre-revenue, pre pre-product sometimes, and you're trying to identify a valuation for them. So one of the key things that we look at is one, their stage, Two, what we look at is essentially how much does the company need today in order to get to that potential that they're looking for or be able to enable the roadmap that they have for the next year or year and a half, right? So when we look at that, if they're raising a million, then we need to factor in the dilution for these founders. One of the key things that sometimes we guide our founders on is you, you need to increase the valuation, and that's not in your favor or in our favor, but it's essentially in your favor for the sense of you guys as dilution. You need to stay in the business. You need to be able to grow the business and continue to raise further. This is a heavily... For sure. uh, so you protect the founders. Exactly. We protect the founders as well. But also, a lot of the times, we've seen founders come with pre-product, pre-revenue, or sometimes with product, but no essentially scale over the years, for example, and they have been not growing that much and expect a very high valuation because in the industry, X startup raised at a particular valuation. And then here, as, as, as um, disciplined investors, we need to really have a discussion or a conversation with the founders like this is what the market is at today this is what we should be looking at today this is where you're at in terms of your fundamentals as well we can't just grab multiples from the US and this startup raised X kind of multiple out of uh, Silicon Valley and this is what we're going to do today because there's a lot of potential so it's a lot about conversation dynamics and this is how we grow and see which founders we're willing to work for over the long uh, journey that we have together. So fantastic. And, and Dash, for, for you guys, I mean, it... for us, it's, it's more art than science because we're early stage investors. And so what we do is we look at a lot of commonalities and the successful companies we've invested in. So like a good founder that you've got chemistry with, a niche market versus a growing market, any sort of uh, let's say differentiator, which could be tech, could be one of these new slang words like ML or AI, or it could just be first mover advantage. And once you sort of factor in those things and give a weight to each, like Tina said, you look across the pond, you see, okay, what are these companies? companies value themselves at. But the most important thing, and the reason we're in an inflation bubble right now in our region, is because people don't discount to our region. They don't say, okay, well, it's a 10x SaaS multiple in the US, it should be around you know, 7x, 6x for our region. And that's so important to do, because as our friends at Magnet pointed out earlier, we are starting to get some mid-market acquisitions, yeah. but nowhere near enough. I can probably name them on, on one hand. And I think until there's a history of company A car and company X for 100 million, 200 million, there's not enough liquidity in our region to justify the same valuations as internationally. Definitely. That's a great point. Um, from a startup perspective, I mean, how did you perceive valuation. I mean, the whole idea is, must have been, you know, I just, I need money and I need mm -hmm. money now and I need a lot of money because I want to go big. Um, but then you had to kind of take a step back, probably go through a few accelerator programs, get that guidance to understand what it took. Right? Definitely, yeah. So for us, so we, funnily enough, have been bootstrapped over the last, since our launch, over the last three years. So we launched in 2019 and we were heavily bootstrapped because Omar and I were working um, full-time jobs as well as running Let's Work on the side. We only resigned from our jobs in September of last year to really focus on Let's, let's Work full-time because that's when we realized that, you know, this is the time to really scale the business. Um, valuations, I, it's, it's funny because I think you started off with it's a science and an art you said it's more of an art than a science I think it's 
at early stage is purely art. I honestly think it's it's definitely a, a, a maybe. Well, number one, I think it's a it's a it's a result of what the market says. Really, um, if 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 you're hot, if you're a fintech, if you're even if you're pre-product, pre-revenue, you could easily you could not easily, but I've seen raises in the Middle East of you know five million dollars on a thirty million dollar valuation. You know, you're starting to see those crazy numbers now as well, without any sort of traction at all. It obviously, so I guess it it, it, it depends on the sector you're in. Um, it depends on the founding team as well. So if you have a stellar sort of founding team who are you know penetrating a market or a sector which they have them they themselves have massive experience in, then you sort of factor that into it as well. Um, I've 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 see, spoken to founders who've had conversations with VCs, for example, where they started bringing in multi, like revenue multiples and stuff. But then all that really goes to completely down the drain because you know you can't really have revenue multiples of you know 17x for you know IPO businesses in the U.S. applying to you know startups in the same sector here because those businesses have been around for you know 10, 15 years while you as a startup you've only been around for a year. So I think that's something that was really interesting. Um, honestly, I think it's 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 I think founders as well. I don't know how many founders there are in the audience. If we can have a raise of hands, oh, yeah, okay, fantastic. So you guys really need to be talking to each other. These guys are, by the way. So the VCs, a lot of the VCs, they they spend a lot of time talking to each other and you know getting an idea of you know what's they happening in the market and everything. <laughs> Should so, so I think founders right. really need to engage with each other. They should, you know, they should be discussing. Okay, who are the VCs that you that you've spoken to? What was your experience like with them? Who was nice? Who wasn't so nice? Because that's a lot of the time that is the case as well. Um, so founders really need to engage with one another and get get some ideas as well as to what the market is saying as well. That's actually how Tina and I met. Was she heard a rumor that I valued a startup at 100 million? She found my LinkedIn, <laughs> reached out, and said, "Can you justify this to me?" And it turned out that the startup was actually just completely. Yeah, and they said they were lead, leading the round for them. So I'm like. Oh. Are you? <laughs> Which but didn't zero, commitment. Yeah, zero, zero commitment. Zero commitment. Thank God for Tina, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say something about one thing that you said about uh, startups going uh, around raising $5 million at $30 million pre revenue and everything. That's also a big duty for investors in the region to actually set the tone to what they will allow or not allow, right? If some startups did that, then kudos to them, right? That's, that's great. And if they're able to continue doing that and actually build a strong business, then that's great. But that shouldn't be also what we expect from founders to come and say that, oh, X did that, then we're going to do that. At the end of the day, um, investors or VCs have a fiduciary duty to their LPs. And it was as well to you to actually give you that this is a long journey and we need to expect uh, macro trends and we need to expect in the, in the next 10 years, you don't want to overvalue your startup and when you're exiting, mark that down, right? So this, there always should be a balance within the conversation and it's about the investors to know when to hold and when to fold and when to come in and when to es essentially have a conversation with the founders. The problem originates, to be honest, is because you have a lot of VCs that want to justify to their LPs fund. And so what they'll do is they'll mark up investments and say, look, mm -hmm. the investments we've made at this time are worth 2, 3x, let's raise another fund. And that's why there's an overvaluation in our region right now, is because people are so obsessed with the returns Raising. on paper without realizing, as Tina said, what that means in the long term. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that Dash doesn't make mistakes, but I feel comfortable saying this because, we're, like I said, we're an evergreen structure. So of one of the mistakes we've made, it's not overvaluing a company. Because ultimately, as you were saying, nobody wins when a company is overvalued. A lot of times we think about what well, this can happen in two years, but not what happens in 10 years. And I think that's the fundamental issue in our region right now. Fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, my next question is going to be about filtering through startups, right? So I'm a startup. I land up and I'm like, hi, Shirouk, I really want to pitch my idea to you. Do I, first of all, do I send you an email or how do I get in touch? Yeah, in any way whatsoever. You have our number, text us, call us, not call us. No, no, us, I don't, I'm, I'm okay. I'm <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm a but startup in the audience. Essentially, I mean. at Shuruk, yeah. we do have an application form uh, on our website. You can go there, apply. Uh, we have a sprinter pass kind of kind of model where we don't want to waste founders' times essentially having their deals in our pipeline Perfect. because we know how how much of a struggle for you guys and how much we, we don't want we we to waste your time as well. And if we're actually in the process, we directly reach out to, we give you an answer either way, whether we're passing or we want to continue the conversation. We give you also, when we have the conversation, a clear overview of the steps, what we're going to do next, and so on and so forth. So you have a, a bit of an awareness on that. Um, and you can also email us, reach out to us on LinkedIn. So it's a, we can just have a coffee outside and this would be one conversation, Amazing. right? So that's I think you mentioned something that a lot of startups in the room, I'm sure, struggle with. You contact a VC, you're expecting a reply. 
and then it's silence. Two months, three months, six months, and you're like, yo, are you gonna just, just say no, just in any format, just tell me no. And I, I appreciate that, you know, Shuruk being an, such an incredible investor, I mean, this deserves a round of applause, just being able to communicate a yes or no with your startup. So thank you so much um, for, for mentioning this. Uh, I mean, my main question really was gonna be around filtering through these guys. So what, um, you know, how do you really support these startups with their valuation? So they come forward and is it usually the case that a startup comes to you with a valuation or do they usually come to you and ask for a term sheet? So it depends, right? So sometimes um, they do come with a valuation. Sometimes it's uh, you're the investor, so we'd like you to give us um, And do you, do you find any discrepancies in those valuations? This is <laughs> All the, time. All the time. But it's fine. It's okay if, if, if I'd actually prefer to see a startup come and approach me with a valuation and justify it. As long as there's a method to the madness, you can start the, comp the relationship with a compromise. But I find it just ridiculous, especially in this day and age, to come and say, well, we don't have an idea of what our valuation is. Do a bit of work, be a little bit creative, figure out what other companies are valuing themselves out. And then once you start to negotiate with the founders and the, and the VCs, you realize that, like, like I said, the start of any good relationship is compromise. Exactly. And, and from a startup's perspective, actually, did you go to investors with a term sheet or would you request for one? Uh, no. I mean, so it, just in terms of some history on what we've done, so we, we've raised um, a small pre-seed round last, at the end of last year uh, from 500 startups as well as a bunch of angel investors as well. Um, obviously, dealing with the two types of um, the investors is, is, is very, very different. Angels, because they're probably less sophisticated unless they're super angels where they've you know, actively invested in previously in the past, uh, while 500 usually come with their own sort of you know, baggage and, and you know, with their, their own sort of terms and stuff. So, um, so it really varies. Um, I think, I mean, like, I, like, like these guys have said, there's always room for negotiation. Like there's, there's, there's always a negotiation sort of a tactic and there's, all, there's a lot of sort of give and take as well. Like, okay, we can work on this, you can, I can increase your allocation, I can do this, I can do that. So I think definitely um, just always just have a conversation with them and be super frank. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, there's definitely a lot of people out there, especially from angels I've, I've seen as well, from my own personal experience and, and from my friends as well, where because, the, because they're not as sophisticated, they, they're kind of like, oh, what, I'm only getting 1% of your business by, by investing in, you know, 100K or 500K check or whatever it is, um, and they don't get that, you know, that 1%, you know, is, 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 not, is not a law on paper, they're probably more traditional sort of um, businessmen, for example, but that 1% has, you know, exponential growth to grow very, very quickly in terms of value. Um, so so, so yeah, I think we, it, yeah, it really depends sure. on, the, on the type of investor that you're yeah, speaking to. And I guess this leads me back to Tina, you know, so why do we think there's such a big discrepancy in their valuations versus what, you know, you found out from the due diligence? Is it, you know, bad advice? What, what, yeah. what could it be? So with us, it, we, we kind of get to the due diligence stage once we've set the tone on what the valuation could be, right? Okay. Once we know that, uh, let's say this is a fantastic business, amazing thesis, we want exposure in that thesis, A plus founders, that's a given, we want to back A plus founders all the way. Once we have all of these uh, metrics and if the valuation is unreasonable, because as we just mentioned, the, the, the trends in the ecosystem, for example, now in, these, in this past uh, year or two, uh, we do have a conversation. And as you guys mentioned, this is actually the art of conversation when you can give and take with the founders, you get to, to a mid-level and then you yeah. continue. A lot of we, so I wanted to also mention one thing when he said the 1% if I'm investing X amount. A lot of the times if we do believe this is an exceptional founder, if we do believe this is a, a business that has a significant potential and we know that we can come in with X amount and we don't necessarily agree 100% with the valuation, but we're willing to bet on this business because we know the potential, then yes, we come in with that 1% and we continue to show you and create value to the founder so that we will be able to grow our ownership and continue to help you and support mm. you uh, along the way. Fantastic. No, great. Uh, all very valid points. Um, thank you, Tina. So, I mean, let's go, let's go to Dash for a second. Um, do you have a certain profile for Dash? Is there... Is it just early stage or do you look at something very specific that we can, you know, 
if, so if I think there's a couple of things that have to stay true across any industry. Like it has to be post-product. There has to be something to show for. But ultimately, the word traction is, is honestly, it changes industry by industry. So at the moment, we're leading a deal with a company that has a very high GMV, but absolutely no monetization. Mm -hmm. And for us, the important thing to show in terms of traction is, can you demonstrate over 6, 12, 18 months sustainable but exciting growth across a couple number of KPIs, and that's sort of the first foot in the door. From that, like I said, we have our, our strategic expertise in fintech, healthcare, renewable energy, but ultimately, we also are learning all the time, and we're also exploring new industries. So as long as you're an early stage company, you're demonstrating that traction I spoke about, and there's chemistry with the founders, then I think you can find any kind of reason for a relationship. Perfect, and it, again, it takes two to tango, right? So I'm a startup, I wanna apply to a specific VC to, to raise funds. I mean, what's the art here? So for you as a startup, what do you think, Hamza, when you're looking for um, VCs or angels, what's your, what's the profile you have in mind? And I'd love to know if there was a discrepancy from when you first started to raise to now. If you, what was yeah. that clarity moment for you? So my experience with angels has been Fantastic! I've been so so happy with the angels that we've brought in on board. Um, they have been um, they've been syndicates. They've been sort of individuals who've just been able to because they're personally invested. They're not people who are you know handling someone else's money. They're actually personally invested in the business. So they're um, incentivized to then unlock so many doors for you at so many different levels. Whether it's from like a from our side, for example. So we we have all sorts of hotels and co-working spaces and cafes across the across the, the UAE across the UAE, Portugal, um, Bahrain, and so now with like one of our angel investors. He's a veteran in the hospitality sector, so now he's basically like getting us having um, you know meetings with the the, the, the heads and the, the senior directors or the CEOs of Mary and IHG and stuff for the Middle East, as opposed to us going off and you know going from the bottoms, taking a bottoms up approach and speaking to you know the the, the, the lower end or the or the, me, the middle managers, for example. So angels, I think, have huge right. potential to unlocking so many so many doors. VCs as well. I think I think one thing I'm, I, I think what excites me when speaking to a VC is when they themselves have a lot of operations experience so like with you guys in dash for example with like the pharmaceutical experience I, and if, I think I think that is, is is extremely extremely important because I think a lot of VCS are always saying things like you know oh I'm, I'm we're founders first or oh we're, we're with you to the end and all that kind of stuff but I think and then there's always this sort of debate about um, like you know having um, silent investors or having smart investors I personally am of the opinion that everyone on your cap table needs to be a smart investor everyone on your cap table needs to be someone who's going to be bringing some value to the table whether whether it's through your, the network, whether it's through operational, whether it's through finance. Um, so I think those, those things are really, really important. So Great. if you can identify certain, uh, certain VCs or individuals in those, in, those, in those VCs who can help unlock certain doors, then definitely Great. go for them. Awesome. I'm just going to uh, finalize our uh, panel, which, uh, man, that was fast. Um, we, I want to run a fire question to uh, our panelists. Sorry, this one is not for you, Hamza. If you had $10 million, uh, a blank check from, an, from a fund or investor to say, you can invest this only into one startup, which industry or which technology would you invest in? You want to go first? Yeah. You want me to go first? You can, I, I do have the answer. The thing we're most excited about, honestly, is the continuous democratization of otherwise sort of elitist products. So what I mean by that is right now we're starting to see startups focus on providing other startups with artificial intelligence training, machine learning training. And when I look at our portfolio, when I look at sort of al tubbi telemedicine for everyone, Liwa, SME lending for the missing middle, what we want to focus on is, is serving the underserved. And so when I see companies like this, decentralized finance, for example, these things really excite me and I would 100% put 10 million in that. Mass adoption. Perfect. Thank Thank you. And Tina? Uh, for us, I, for me, I believe uh, I'd give it to either fintech infrastructure or blockchain infrastructure. And the reason uh, I say that is we need to enable interconnectivity between each of the counterparts in the value chain. And today, this has been a struggle with all of the startups in the region, especially, for example, when they want to expand to other markets. Uh, they need to set up a different uh, regulation for that particular market. They need to uh, rebuild the infrastructure that they built for market A and do it in B and C. And, uh, and we need to be able to enable that. And we have been seeing some uh, fintech plays who are focusing on infrastructure blockchain. Now we uh, are so excited to see how the uh, blockchain or the adoption of blockchain will intersect within different sectors between logistics, uh, fintech, of course, but also cybersecurity. So there is a lot of potential moving forward, and these are the things that we'd like to empower, enable, and continue to push forward. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. Big round of applause for our awesome panelists.